Um, I sent one of those new uh, uh, anthologies, um, Silver Tongue Devil anthologies, to my friend in Germany, uh, Jürgen Schneider, who does several, uh, he does Obverts magazine, he does a bunch of magazines there, so I'm hoping maybe he'll review it. Uh -huh. for some of those oh, terrific. Magazines. He's a really good guy, good writer, good translator. Thank you, Ron. That's so nice of you. Really appreciate it. Uh, he's terrific. Oh, and I'll be sending out copies, Ohio State University, hopefully this week, and then hopefully NYU will get their copies. I, I just emailed them, so hopefully they'll get their copies. And then I still have to send one to SUNY Buffalo. Mm. So those are the oh, archives wonderful. I'm reading right now. It's an amazing anthology. You guys did an incredible job. It just really is. It really beautiful, is. beautiful collection of work. Yep. yep. Every page just hits you hard. Yeah. Well, the Silver Tongue Devil anthology, it was from Philip Giambri's five year show. He had a show at Three of Cup Lounge and uh, two other places, Bar 81. And what was the other one, Philip? Identity Bar. Identity Bar. And it was uh, five years of um, people who read at the show or in the book. So since I, I did this show and since I, I announced on Facebook, the theme was the COVID files. Um, I myself got diagnosed with COVID on, and I was sick Ooh, since uh, February wow. 20th. Wow. I um, had the New York traces calling me every day. I, I already finished my quarantine, but I'm not recovered. Um, this is this now the um, 15th day since I first got sick and I've had so many weird symptoms. I still don't have uh, much of my taste and smell, and I'm very, very tired. I had to take a nap today for two and a half hours just wow. to do the show, and I'll probably go lay down after. So uh, yeah. it really knocked me out. And um, I'll tell you, I got it because uh, my friend, my very good friend and my son were the two people I was around without wearing a mask because I thought they were safe. And my friend is in the hospital for five days now, and um, we just got it because we, were, we thought we were safe. We saw each other all the time. So um, it's serious, and um, if you got your shot, good for you. And if you didn't, go get one. And um, you know, hope you feel better. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm getting better, and I'm going to start the show reading a poem, and then we'll get started. So um, this is called um, "The World Is on Lockdown." We are sheltering in place. Grandma Brighty is 91. She lives alone, baking Irish soda bread and chocolate chip cookies. Before the virus, we shopped in supermarkets. We gathered together without fear. Now we are told to stay home. But when you live alone, especially in your senior years, isolation becomes an ugly monster. Without technology, no Facebook posts to search, no Instagram or TikTok to view, no Zoom conferencing to connect you, the isolation monster feeds on loneliness, crawling out from the news on TV. He begins to gnaw at grandma. The family that comforts her is told to avoid her. She finds it hard to understand why. A frightened child calls out in the night. I'm out in the rain. Where are you? Thank you, everyone. And with that, we will begin with our first um, open mic reader. And that would be Peter Mara, if he is here. Um, and we're clocking three minutes. Yep. So everybody gets three minutes. I want to um, I'll quickly, I'll introduce Phil Jambri as our head of security tonight. And Madeline Artenberg is our timekeeper. And at two minutes and 30 seconds, you will hear a ding. And she will make that ding sound right now. And um, it doesn't mean you have to stop. It means wrap it up. And um, let's have a good time today. And I'm really happy everybody's here. And welcome, welcome. And I don't see Peter Mara. So um, we're going to go then to um, Anuk von Prague. Unmute. I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. A tunnel so wide that at first I didn't know it was, in fact, a tunnel. I looked with curiosity at walls and shadows, my own, others seemingly going in the same direction or not, slowly drawing into myself, not knowing day by day, cyberspace beginning to take over. 
dreaming of sunny Florida and Curacao, but I was thrown into a professional ditch, fired. Mm -hmm. My hip gave out from arthritis now, but yes, I got a new hip, hallelujah. Relief short-lived, his life cut short by his own hand, my brother, stumbling into the tunnel. But wait, a light, trees, green and sun, family, togetherness, perfect. But then attacked by a fury, not my own, wounded, arrested, humiliated, playing for the light, the end and change. Nirvana came, another trip. I found a lake reflecting love and food and puzzles and brotherhood and sisterhood. But time grabbed me by the throat, betrayed, abandoned. Trees so bare they can barely breathe, surviving cold so bleak. What was I, a social butterfly? And now, content with isolation, a smaller life, reading, listening, learning, silence, meditation, stillness. Amen, amen to Corona teachings. They're teaching us to stop eating animals, stop and listen. It brings us fever, firestorms raging, illness. Stop and listen to your fear. We are not well, free and the skies, free the, free the skies and free the trees. Be patient, kind and listen to the message. Stop, dream, we can do this. Be still, hear yourself, heal yourself and the other. Be still, stop, listen. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Very happy to have you here today. All right, so um, up next, we're gonna have Patty Carrigan and then Linda Schwartz and then Patrick Hammer. So um, just so you guys can be ready. And Patty Carrigan, you're up. Okay, thank you. One poem, Moonlight Serenade. Charlie was in bed, tubes attached to his body, listened to cartoons on a 19 inch screen, thought of Sophia, his bell of flatbush. When La Luna was full, Charlie used to sing Moonlight Serenade outside Sophia's gate. They'd slow dance to Glenn Miller's rendition. He'd relax his rhythm, hold Sophia closer, recall how safe she felt. Her soft brown curls would drape on his shoulder, her smoky eyes, stele corat, tinted stars over a make-believe Brooklyn sky. His protective hold couldn't save her from breast cancer 20 years ago, their two sons from Vietnam's death call, or their daughter from her husband's fists. A massive stroke took Sonny, his last living friend. His relatives were either dead or couldn't care less. Charlie was in bed, tubes attached to his body, alone except for routine visits from the nursing home staff wondered if Sophia would be there for him when he leaves for the morgue. He hummed Moonlight Serenade, but a dry cough cut his tune short. Sadness, age, and high fever drained his cognition and will to live. His memory was of the past, not the present. He prayed for death's visit. Death would wear a white coat, walk past the rooms, make decisions on who's to come and who's to stay. But death forgot about him. Perhaps death's eyesight was fading when he came by last week, took Hector instead. Tina, his favorite nurse, no longer visited him, was in critical condition due to a new virus going around. He closed his eyes, saw Glenn Miller and his band before Moonlight Serenade at the Waldorf Astoria. Everything was in technicolor. Sophia, radiant and youthful, rose from her table. She came closer, her smoky eyes, Stella Corolat, tinted stars over a make-believe Brooklyn sky. By the entrance, a man in, in a white coat, 
checked his clipboard, greeted Charlie with a smile, and opened the gate. Thank you. Hi, that was great. Next up, we have Linda Schwartz, and then we'll have Patrick Hammer, then Bert Baroff. All right. I um, uh, only wrote a few poems during the pandemic, but, but uh, actually I only completed two, so I'll read those. <laughs> um, I live next door to hospital one mile from what was the uh, epicenter of the epicenter of the pandemic uh, in the United States. And this is called the epicenter. I hear sirens when there are none, drifting on the vapid din. Straining to verify, their approach becomes reality time after time. It's a true war zone. Ambulance backup sounds signaling the delivery of victims to their destiny or my lullaby each night over and over and over again. Angels quickly appear clad in tattered blue gowns. What kind of bizarre heaven is this? Hundreds of souls on stretchers extracted from the gaping mouths of rescue vehicles. Two external moors waiting at bay. Standing by the window, I point and press my remote to change the telling scene outside, but to no avail. And um, one, one more, it's called uh, Still Carrying Lipstick. Uh, I'm still carrying lipstick, not sure I'm why. Uh, these days, one familiarity remains doable and invokes a feeling of normalcy, earrings. My hair is swept up in a ponytail beneath a baseball cap to avoid contact with this potentially lethal novel enemy. But I purposefully sport shiny dangling earrings each and every day. After all, the body is far more than a, than a vulnerable organism. Its beauty, its strength, its ability must intentionally be kept alive. I wear earrings as if nothing has happened. Spring flowers are blooming as if nothing has happened. Songbirds are happy and singing, yet how numb lips are masked. We cannot speak of the unspeakable. We know not its depth. Frozen by conflicting information with fear, shame, and pain, awaiting knowledge that will ignite our internal flame to melt this suspended state. Until then, I'm still carrying lipstick, hope always at reach. I suffer quiet respect and quiet sympathy for all who have succumbed, my beloved father among them. Silent mouths without lipstick, accentuating the raw horror as we navigate this oddly morphed life. Thank you, Linda. I like that, carrying lipstick, hope within reach. That's mm -hmm. very good. And now we're going to Patrick Hammer. Thank you. Two short poems. COVID burnout. Yes, still masked and gloved, staying six feet apart to avoid being six feet under. But I'm done with this, staying inside, cowering most of the spring. I haven't touched or hugged or kissed. It's verboten. Because I'm almost 64, it was decided someone else would do my shopping. But with the summer coming, I've grown fatigued by this decree. Despite this plague, despite so many lives taken from us, I want to take back cautiously all the things taken away from me. I'll cover my face, wear my white cotton gloves like an antebellum southern bell, carry my pure hell to disinfect when I go outside. Otherwise, I think I'll go berserk. I want a fully opened library, not a side door like a speakeasy to pick up books only. I want in, a sit down dinner in a diner and not a soggy burger. I want open doors at the Met all day, every day and no timed visit. The same for the Cloisters, Poets House, Strand Books. I want a movie matinee and my poetry groups. I don't want WebEx, I don't want Zoom. I want a real vaccine, a cure, my life fully mine. Selfish but true, I want, I want, I want. So many dead, I'm done with this. I've done right for half a year and now a year. Unlike this unmasked crowd forming nation. First jab, 
and the door finally unlocks, swings open ever so slightly, but outwards, still not wide enough to pass through, to embrace fully the old pre-pandemic craved for world. So what the after effects or pain that will pass? This needle into muscle, into arm, arms and lifts the weight, the weight, the longing, the need to live fully again. A second jab soon comes, soon closer to a more familiar world. But the stab of those loved and lost who went away will never go away. Almost all who raise their hands now know this pinch. Thank you. Patrick. All right, next up we have Bert Baroff, and then we will have Linda Lerner and uh, Judith Lee Herbert and um, Alan Yashin, if he, Alan would want to do something. All right, Bert Baroff, you are up. You have to just unmute it. Just click it once, it should work. You got it, good. Thank you. I've written about a pandemic, not necessarily in numbers, but in the length of time it has lasted. It's called besotted states. Nature, nurture green in spring, in summer, a cascade of color, in fall, leaves dip in change. In winter, she wears snow's icy white. Human nature marks time very differently. Some see life in black and white with a bruising biased brush, a palette stained with blood. Nature's earth Fervently fertile needs only to be seeded. The soil we choose to seed soils what we may grow. Nature's non judgment ear, non judgmental ear, hears every growl, squeak, roar, every sound to be embraced. Our ears hear dissonance and derision. Nature choreographs life, a petit deux of celebratory steps. Human nature has gracelessly, faithfully choreographed ballets of death. The title the other, the scene, nine black dancers embracing religion, the stage, a home filled with worship, their final positions still, the music continues, unmercifully off key, then silence. Broken by the roar of encore, 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 written, produced, staged in Charlotte, South Carolina. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Linda Lerner. Oh, and then Judith Lee Herbert. Oh, okay, I think I unmuted, right? Yep, yep you're all set. Okay, I'm going to play the recording because it's clearer. But this poem was written at the very beginning of the pandemic. And what you're hearing in the background is the steam coming up. Like, yeah, wow, that's very loud. I know, I don't know what to do about it. Either it's free, I, I don't even want to go into this. <laughs> it's okay, go ahead. How it is. A masked man comes to the door. I see him from the peephole, go out and quickly hand him a large green bag. Tomorrow, I say, he nods, no other words. I rush back inside. 
A neighbor opens the door, a crack, shaking her head. I motion, what choice do I have? She shrugs and shuts her door. The streets are quiet. A few people walk hurriedly by, armed with fear. Fights break out and people's eyes who get too close back off in time. Sometimes not. We don't see bullets strike us, any blood. So we keep on until we can't and become one of the missing. Have you heard from, someone says. No, you, not on Facebook. Maybe he's just taking a break. I heard the same about, stop, you know better. We all do and keep going, eyes averted till we're safe at home, watching people being massacred in another country. It was like that at first, the fourth wall intact, before our death broke it. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. You have another one or that's it? No, I think that's it. Thank you very much, Linda. It's good to see you today. And next up we have Judith Lee Herbert. You have to unmute yourself. Yep. Thank you so much, Linda, for doing this, and especially given what you're going through right now. Thank you. Is Alan going to do anything, or is he just here for the, being an audience? I'm not sure. He'll be back in a minute, but okay. I have one poem that I'm going to do. Okay, go ahead. Lost in Shangri La. Amongst Crimson Chinese rose blossoms, two painted bluebirds sing from branches, surrounded by misty mountain peaks. On the golden folding fan which floats on the wall, as we sit on our pink damask living room sofa, serene. The ancient bearded Chinese man stands beside us in his carnelian colored flowered robe of porcelain, holds his carved wooden staff sturdily and his wise smile washes over us along with the warm soft light from the silk shantung shade above him like a blessing. This is where we shelter in place, in a land that is between here and there, unmasked in a virtual reality, outside snowfall, horizon lost. Thank you. And Alan, Alan is going to do something next, I think. Okay. Okay. Welcome next, Alan Yashin, and then we will have um, um, Ron Brema and uh, Madeline Artenberg coming up. I just to read it with you. Oh, or are you going to read it yourself? Uh, just go ahead. All right. This is a, a little narrative. <laughs> I'll do both parts. It's uh, Cynthia. Oh, Cynthia. Yes, what is it this time, Morris? I can't hear, bear to hear any more bad news. This pandemic is driving me crazy. No, no, this is interesting. Come over to the computer. Morris, I do not want to see your moronic cousin Nathan's Facebook page again. Moronic, he has always been. So why should a little thing like a pandemic affect him? But no, this is about the new credit card I signed up for three months ago. Yes, I remember, Morris. I still don't understand why you needed one more credit card. Well, we haven't been in an actual store in months. Everything we buy is with this credit card on the internet or by phone. And this new card had such an interesting offer. And what did you say the card was called? It's called the Wonder Card. I've never heard of that, Morris. Well, one time long ago, they were saying the same thing about MasterCard. And it was such an interesting offer to encourage people to sign up for the new card. What, bonus miles on our airline? Like we're really going to be flying anywhere during the pandemic? No, no, no. If you charge a minimum of $5,000 over the first three months, you were entitled to select a gift of your choice from them. And I just 
reached the $5,000 limit when I uh, charged that new exercise bike. Oh, oh, well, Cynthia, let me tell you what they offer. Look at this. It says, congratulations from the Wonder Card on reaching $5,000. And look, look, look at the first gift on the list. What? I'm not seeing that correctly. Correctly. Does it really say? Yes, yes, it does. It says, you are entitled to one free wish. One free wish. Is that some kind of joke? A credit card company making a joke? I don't really think so. Well, Morris, that's ridiculous. A free wish. Who ever heard of such a thing? Well, we could test it out. Sure, Morris, why not? I'll ask for my hair to magically look like I've just been to the Mariana Beauty Salon and she just gave me a spectacular cut and dye job. But, but what if it's not some kind of joke? We can't waste on one wish on your hair, as lovely as it is. As much as I always love something to be done. So, so what do you think we should do? Look, look, I just mean, what if we really did have a wish? Just one wish. That wonder card could make it come true. What would it be, Cynthia? What would that one wish be? Oh, God, Morris. There's so much to wish for in these terrible times. Where would we start? Yes, my love. Where would we start? Thank you, Alan, and thank you, Judith. It was good to see both of you today. Um, and next up, um, we have Ron Bremer, and then um, Madeline Ottenberg, and then Big Mike. Yeah, I foolishly brought some non-COVID poems, so yeah, I don't know if that's acceptable. That. You're acceptable. fine. Okay. It's only a suggestion. Okay. This is, uh, these are in honor of uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Place up those boots. Avoid the puddles of united minds. Dissolve and survive the tyranny of institutionalized rapport as you creep numbly through the thought glue. That kettle of emotionless emotion, that requisite embrace of the non-real, that plunder of the soul. Maybe, just maybe, you can instigate a kludge that might save us. Do you keep your map in your glove box? And second and last, an umbilical cord between your mind and mine purges the rot and the caffeine in me, makes me again an infant, a suckling as the circle of life rears its wanton beauty. And that's it. Thank you, everybody. You're on for being here. And next up, we have Madeline Ottenberg. Hi, everyone. As, as you know, during the uh, slowdown of life during COVID, a light was shown on Black rights, women's rights, etc. So this is Chosen Seats. His nose curved like a pot-bellied stove. Grandpa was a six foot two episode in my land of five footers. We'd quietly walk along Bay Parkway, stopping when I pointed at Juju Bees or Superman comic books. When he caught my finger in the foam half of his evening's Rheingold beer, he poured me my own in a jelly glass. It's good, it's medicine, he said. Grandpa rode his wooden rocking chair in front of the bedroom window like an orthodox Jewish cowboy. Traditional leather straps wrapped around his arms fluttered as if fringes on a suede jacket. When I read out loud from library books, he'd point to letters. On the next visit to the candy store, we bought a black and white notebook modeled like a cow's hide. He practiced ABCs in capitals and lower case. I could not break his habit of writing from right to left. Once he took me by the hand down the parkway to his synagogue, up a staircase to the balcony filled only with women and girls. Grandpa let go my hand and reappeared downstairs among hundreds of men wearing caps like his, swaying, praying, buzzing like bees. He wet his fingertips to turn the page. I leaned over the balcony screaming, Grandpa, don't leave me up here. I'm not like them. I'm your English teacher. I'm your Rheingold girl. 
Thank you. Madeline. All right. Uh, next up, we have um, Big Mike. And I just want to make sure that uh, Peter Mara is not here. Um, Susan Wyman or Sora Litsky or Olivia Grayson. If you any, if I missed any of you guys, then let me know. But I didn't see you guys here. All right, so we're going to Big Mike, and then um, yeah, let's go to Big Mike next, yeah. and then we'll have um, Jack Savros is not here. Harvey Sauce, I believe, is here. We'll go to Harvey next after Mike. Go ahead, Mike. Are you just bored? Is that the real reason you keep texting her back? You're just so fucking bored that you actually look forward to her stalking you? Is that it? Yeah, I guess so. I really am that bored these days. This COVID-19 pandemic lockdown has gone on for a whole year now, 12 months to be exact. In the past, I was going to live open mics at least twice a week. Live ones, not virtual ones on Zoom or in cyberspace. I was going out dancing at the Pyramid Club once a week, sometimes twice, even three times in a weekend. Now, a big day is a trip to Dwayne Reed, the West Side Marker of the Post Office, on a good day. Yeah, so I'm bored these days that even the unwanted attention of a psycho cyber stalker like her is a welcome distraction in these months of an ending ennui at all. There was this episode in the original Star Trek where Captain Kirk reflects on an interstellar villain who dies of loneliness. To be that alone without even so much as a torturer to keep you company, how truly lonely that must have been. So now I almost relish the moments that the crazy bitch from hell texts me with her endless nattering words of eternal annoyance. Something to look forward to at the end of the day, but she's really gone off the rails in the crazy train these days. She's starting to call me a little fan again, White Devil in Cantonese. It's her pet name for me, White Devil. Whatever she gets a particularly big bug stuck up her ass about me. She once texted me hundreds of times over 24 hours, low fan, low fan, low fan, low fan, low fan, low fan, in English, in Chinese transliteration, and in Chinese pictograms for some perceived slight she received at my hands. And here, I didn't even know my primitive flip phone was even capable of transmitting Chinese characters on its screen. She's texting me endless streams of Guai Ji Lo Fan or go fuck yourself, white devil, just because I had the audacity to ask her if she wanted to attend one of the few remaining live open mics still left in the city these days with me on the eve of the Lunar New Year, the year of the Ox. Wait, you ask your stalker out on a date? What the fuck is wrong with you, Big Mike? Are you mental or something? Well, I was only trying to be polite. If someone takes the time and energy out of her busy schedule in order to cyber stalk me, I figured the least I can do to show my appreciation is to ask my stalker out on a magical night of smoked salmon arugula and brioche, a glass of cheap red Merlot, a dozen roses, and some tiramisu for dessert at the local Starbucks Reserve in the West Village as recompense. I did tell you that I'm known as the polite stalker victim, didn't I? I always try to keep a civil relationship between myself and my stalker, and I was always share my schedule with the stalker involved. It's simply the right thing to do. I do have a long history of experience as a stalky, and quite frankly, I'm flattered when some crazy psycho bitch from hell decides on her own volition to begin stalking me. It means I'm stalker worthy. It's a real boost to my sense of self esteem. This time, she went post on my ass because I asked her if she would do me the favor of ordering a few copies of the latest New Year's Day alternate marathon anthology that poem of mine appears in. This is only available online. I don't have a credit card or PayPal account. I offered to pay her back in cash or by check, but she launched in this long online tirade about how I was nothing but a vainglorious narcissistic whore, just like the former President Donald J. Trump, simply because I told her I wanted to send a copy to each of my four ex wives. I refuse to be a pawn in your vainglorious narcissistic mind games that you're playing on your exes, you narcissistic whore, you. Well, you could have knocked me down with a feather after that cyber squid. I mean, it's not like I've never been called a man whore before. But a vainglorious man, narcissistic man, or that really hurt. And here I thought she really loved me. The end. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. And next up, we have Harvey Sauce. Uh, am I unmuted? Yes, you are. We can hear you good, very well. Here, if I can find it. Where the hell did you go? There you are. Okay. This is called uh, High Tea at Four as the Apocalypse Draws Near. We'll sit there drinking tea, reading tea leaves, you and I. Yours will be a lap sang souchong or a complex pu'er, smelling of morning mist and not quite the end of the world. Mine will be a more gentle green with peaceful notes of sights unseen the Taj Mahal Catman do. Paris as viewed from the observation deck of the Eiffel Tower, or perhaps one of those four famous oolongs, Wu Yi mountainsides 
are known for. Da Hong Pao, big red robe, Ti Lu Wan, iron monk warrior, Shu Jin Yi, golden water tortoise, Bai Ji Guan, white coxcomb, all from one of the four famous bushes named by the ancients like constellations, grown high enough up to possibly survive us. Amazing how much one can fit into a teacup taken straight or with a splash of milk when expectations have shrunk so. We will, I surmise, share a plate of those little tea cookies, expensive, but what the hell? What else are we going to do with our unused traveler's checks? Ours will be a corner table, ceiling high windows, buying us a panorama of tea enthusiasts clinging to ice flows, Arctic and Antarctic, turning deep sea trenches into pitchers of unsweetened iced tea, not having packed anything much to go, there being no point to it with oblivion knocking at the door. We will stuff our faces with cookies and burden ourselves of secrets. Play footsies under the table, our socks shrieking of static electricity, having left our shoes on the doormat in keeping with tea house decorum. A few boats will still rock resistance at the wharf like melting ice cubes before dragging their captains under following some code of conduct till the end. You will say you love me. I will say I love you over and over again until sun and moon flee the scene in an RV too ashamed to look on at the mess we campers have made one small step, no giant leap apparently not even potty trained, global warming having steeped the continents to a muddy brown. Hoku Sai, prince of a rough sea, hung on the walls, will complement our longings too long unexpressed nicely. The hostess, ever so polite, will maintain the painted mask of a geisha, apologizing for any slight tremor in her hand as she serves us offering complimentary spoonfuls of jasmine pearls to cleanse the palate, if not the conscience. Sharing as she bends towards us with more hot water, the last of the first blush tea leaves, some perfume neither of us can identify, with just a hint wafting out from under her kimono of the menstrual flow of catastrophe. Uh, cancel that. Go away. Okay. That's me. I think that's time, Harvey. Thank you very much. Um, all right, next up, um, we have Janet Wade, and then we will have Gordon Gilbert, Paul Austin, and J.R. Torek. So uh, Janet Wade is next, and I welcome Janet. I know she had a couple of problems. She missed a few of the other shows, and I'm happy to see her here today. Janet, you can unmute yourself. It's all you right now. Okay, I'm on mute now. You can hear yes, me? We can hear, yes, we can. Oh. Welcome. Good to oh, see welcome. you. Good to see you guys too. All right. Um, and unfortunately, my COVID poem is not with me. So I forget it at home this morning. I'm at work now. So I'm going to read and substitute it with some other um, depression poem. <laughs> so the one I'm going to read is called It's Okay to Mourn. And it goes like this It's okay to mourn. Yes, it's okay to mourn. When the one who departed was your very home. Why he had to go? Only God knows. But be assured, he's happier on Evan's shore. He completed his task and had to move on to meet his God and to sing his song. Victory in Jesus, I've made it in. Family, friends, and children, be happy. Now I'm walking with my king. Miss me if you must. But please let me go. My job here is done. Look at yourself and you'll know. 
Your love for me has been perfect. So now I can go on to the mansion God prepared for me, which is now my new home. Look to God for comfort. He'll fill the gap. He is more than enough. In him, you will find a lot. Food when you are hungry, shelter in the storm. The wind beneath your wings in prayer sound that alarm. For your tears, he will buckle and rock you all to sleep. He's a friend when you are lonely, bread when you want to eat. So let Jesus be your father. He knows just what to do. And let me go on to glory, knowing you will all make it through. Love always. I play the part. Thank you. Got it. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Gordon Gilbert. Can you hear me okay, Linda? Yes, we can. Welcome, Gordon. Thank you. Uh, I have a few short poems written about COVID. First one, uh, a COVID hawk. In the sky, a hawk and some birds free statues while others scatter. Pandemic panicked, underneath a COVID hawk, we freeze in lockdown. Uh, the next one is about uh, a very bad person uh, not taking a breakup very well during the pandemic. So much for love. You close the door on all I hoped might be. Just one last kiss I'll steal before you go. My lips on yours. Before I quarantine myself, lest my condition diagnosed today infects those whom I still hold dear and love. A poisoned parting kiss for you, my dear, before you go. So much for love. And uh, Patrick uh, Hammer read something very close to, um, I got involved in this thing where you write stories that are only six words long. It was something Hemingway did when he was in Paris, I think. So this is one that I wrote, Patrick. Finally, social distancing, six feet under. And great, finally, un great, unfortunately great. <laughs> okay, Patrick. And finally, um, a pandemic Hallmark card. I think it's time. Until this hell is at an end, stay safe and well and strong, dear friend. In every way until the day when we can be unmasked and free to share the air. Till then, I say, take care. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Very nice. Next up, we have Paul Austin. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good. So uh, I have four short poems. Uh, the first one is an homage uh, to Beckett. It has an epigraph that says, astride the grave at a difficult birth. It's from uh, Waiting for Godot. And it's, uh, uh, it was written before the pandemic, but I think it applies. Uh, here, so here's for Beckett. Roll out, roll up, roll on, roll down, roll in, roll through, no matter because despite whenever again, always as before, we have, we do, we will continue rolling on, on, and on. Uh, the next one is uh, another short poem for Delmar uh, Schwartz. And as soon as I can find it. Well, I can't find it. I'll do one. Uh, uh, I spent a lifetime acting, so, uh, and it took me a long time to figure out how to play Pinter. So here's a short uh, poem uh, about how to play Pinter with all his pauses and silences. 
how to play Pinter. A pause is a broken silence, which when taken too long, threatens the unspeakable. Um, well, then I, I can't find my third one, so I'll skip to my fourth one and call it a night. Uh, this one is called Nightfall. It too was written earlier than the pandemic, but it is uh, functions as sort of advice for the pandemic. This is Nightfall. Leave the lamp unlit, unclose the window curtain, look beyond the glass. Can you not agree the uninhabited night pulses with desire? Can you not allow the blue anticipation murmur in your ear? Let go your heart's fear. Give of your eyes to vastness that it may be seen. Thank you. Paul, oh, welcome. I hope to come see you back again next time. And now we have uh, J.R. Torek is up, and then Carrie Radner, Joshua Meander, and uh, Austin Alexis, if he's here. I don't see Austin, but um, I see okay. the other ones. All right, Hi. Judy, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you, Linda. Hey, pray for blessings. I hope you feel better soon. Uh, so no COVID poems tonight. My dad's birthday um, is next week, so he kind of wins out. So I have two for him. I need the second one to get through the first. This is a virgin read. Um, 13. For Martin T. Raphael, March 15th, 1936 to July 9th, 2009. I've always been tristodextrophobic, though my husband swears Friday the 13th is a rare and wonderful phenomena. Rare, yes, though we had three in 2009. But you didn't mind the number, Dad. 13 stars on the original flag of the United States of America, the one you proudly put up to fly from your flagpole on July 3rd, the day you went into the hospital, the one I hoisted down and folded on July 5th because you weren't home to do it. You laughed at so many things, especially no 13th floor in office buildings and hotels, my sense of superstition stronger than yours. Yet, 13 at the Last Supper, a prophecy, a premonition I never got until now. M for Marty, M the 13th letter of the alphabet. My brother Mikey's birthday, 211 equals 13. Mine, 76 equals 13. My mother Kathy's favorite number. We three circle around you and your room number 13 in the ICU. Yes, my superstition greater than before as I see the date, your burial on July 13th. And quickly to the next. Gasoline. I look forward to times when dad would say, we've got to stop for gas. A budgeting role model, he always pumped his own, saved a few cents on every gallon. I'd stand beside him anxious for the fumes to fill the air, inhale and fill my lungs with the slick, sweet smell of gasoline. Every time we'd stop, Ma would caution from the front seat, it's not good for her to sniff that stuff. It's probably toxic. She'll get sick. Dad would smile, take a deep breath. See, it's okay. And I'm not sick. And he'd tell me again how he'd stand beside his dad, catch all the fumes he could before the tank was full, but that somehow it smelled different, not quite so sweet. Funny how the smell has changed, not really sweet as all, as I pump my own all alone. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Good to see you. Um, if anybody's wondering the order I'm going in, I'm going in the order that people signed up on Eventbrite. So uh, that's the order that I'm going in. And next up, we have um, Carrie Magnus Radna, and then Joshua Meander, Hope Wiener, Ron Colm, and Ellen Lytle. So uh, Carrie, you're up. Hi, everybody. It's wonderful to see everybody again in this space. Yeah, thank you, Linda, for hosting. It's, it's a wonderful reading. 
Okay, I have one poem in five parts. Live music today or music during COVID. One, after the audience members left the great hall, many did not survive re-entry. The open re relationship between players and their followers were forever changed, fractured, broken. The velvet chairs are empty. Music is now made from silence. Two, what about our noisemakers? Meanwhile, we have expelled a ton of psychic salt water from our arms till we could feel our fingertips again. Swimming in imaginary oceans with masks on, every touch, feel, and breath is precious. Three, live music by poor performers, poor monetarily, not by execution, is currently in hibernation. Singers are especially vulnerable when virtual, they're stymied into submission. Those early victims, the vocalists vocalizing in groups, their lives were cut short by COVID, gasping for every breath. My voice is in heavy hesitation. Four, gigs are canceled, venues are boiled up, performance work is drying up, so all the players all move back home. The lights on Broadway and the opera shine on their own. Five, I am afraid to sing. It is too silent in here. Even theater goats have stopped listening. Since my music self has slept for many months in hibernation no mode, the sounds of poetry became potent in my ears as any orchestra. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. All right, next up we have Joshua Meander. Cat with moon eyes. Earlier, she had the face of a fierce lion, while her firm, slender figure was a lady's indeed and adored throughout Egypt. She chased and chewed up enemies like lethal vermin at the entrance to kingdom of royalty decked in layers of golden jewelry on their wrists. Behind the palace was a lake. Basset was her name. Bastet was her name. She dipped her sore feet in the lake for a long spell. When she dried her wet feet, the reflection in the lake revealed the transformation of her head from a lion's now to a cat's. Tenderness anointed her like perfume. She became the bringer of wholeness, channeling pleasure in the fine arts. Thus, not overshadowed by warfare, she is equated with tranquility. Bastet embellish tomorrow's skies with solemn glance of your glazed moon eyes. Joshua. I think you got muted. Okay, thank you, Joshua. And that's it, just one for me. Very good, thank you. Um, um, next up, we have Pope Wiener, then Ron Combe. Hi, everyone, and again, thank you for all the beautiful work. I just Being have a short help. poem. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, okay, great, thank you, everybody. Um, ugly, dirty, raw. God bless punk rock anthems that painted basement walls. We are angels on strobe light mountains, rolling in Jackson Pollock's snow. Jump, thrash, scream, wail, ugly, dirty, raw. Some will never come back. Don't take sticky floors and vile toilets for granted. Wake up, ugly, dirty, raw. Don't waste time with the overly quaffed. Sing ugly, dance dirty, fuck raw. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, Hope. And now we go to Ron Combe. Hi, everybody. Um, it's been, can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. We're, yep. It's Welcome, been Ron. It's been years since I got let go from the bookstore in Chelsea Market. And this is a poem I wrote shortly after that. Subway story in a time of COVID-19. I had to travel into Manhattan <clears throat> to cash my unemployment check. So I sat in the front car, car wearing a mask doing my best to avoid the other passengers. After leaving the bank, I walked back to Union Square Station 
and found a place on the platform where there weren't too many people standing around waiting. Time goes by and no train appear. There's a sudden movement as a woman, maybe late fifties, tosses her bag and her mask onto the tracks, then clumsily climbs down and joins them. Hey, what's up? I shout through my mask. She moans and says that this is how she's going to get home. She's tired of everything. She edges over towards the third rail. And unfortunately, because my back is so messed up, I can't physically grab her. So I unleash my best zinger. Do you believe in any kind of God? Because if you do, you got to know how pissed off he or she is going to be if you touch that thing. A young guy comes running over, jumps onto the tracks and lifts the lady up, depositing her on the platform. He holds her, waiting for the police, who do show up pretty quickly. My train finally arrives, and I go home amazed at how the universe works. Thank you very much, everybody. Please be safe in this strange time. You're Ron Colm. Great poem. And now we go to Ellen Lytle. Hi. Um, Welcome, Ellen. Big desk is not even mine. It's uh, my husband's allowed me to use his big screen. And um, okay. so I did write several poems. Anyway, hi, everybody. I'm so glad to see everyone here. Um, mm -hmm. This is one of the first ones I wrote. Because to me, um, there was a lot of beauty. The days were beautiful, many of them. And we couldn't do anything. It was like I was paralyzed, you know, or we all were. I felt that way. A jump. Poor April wastes away in front of exploding calorie pear in London plains. While well, outside the bedroom window, two rags of sky float across a water tower, weathering next door. Who's to say the neighbor's brick wall isn't a piece of new life form now? A slab of concrete on 200-year-old stone in air that's now been cleansed. So not much traffic, no garbage makers, and just one person. That's all I see, an everyday man on a roof across our street, wearing a 1950s hat, and he jumps. <laughs> Is New York a living replica of the wide world in real time? The first poem, that poem, A Jump, was in March, April, this one's September of 2020. Oh my God, additional buildings, boldly flashing sky high and uselessly dumbstruck. They will never be brave enough to lend a hand. Though yesterday we could feel the lump lodged in our throats, falling down to our stomach across 72nd Street. As if we swallowed whole the Upper West Side and a tired sun glowers giving no warmth at all. It's a new season coming at us like ice, though September should be warm, dry, sun-filled, <laughs> sun not bagging a fox in a field <clears throat> while someone throws a hood overhead. But this was a summer that lifted off in a huff, and much too soon we're left, all of us, with a chill. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. And next up, we have Leslie Prostaman, and then Lou Gruper, and then James Dean Rivera. Leslie, you're up. Hi, thank you. Um, I tried this out on Friday at Calling All Poets, so some of you have heard this before. Uh, but this was um, Love Affair during the time of COVID, and it's called Air Duende. Duende means passion, inspiration, and it usually derives from the earth. So this is called air duende. We meet like cliches as soon as we see each other. We grab hold, hold on, 
don't think when we burrow into our necks. I resonate into his. He smells like burnt sugar and hums back at me. Inhaling, he holds me gently, kisses me passionately. No, it's not even that. I can't say what it is. Do you think he's a sorcerer? I don't even like him. How did this happen through electronics persist into our persons? Why does my heart speed up just thinking about his Porsche and his Hacienda and Taos? What's respect got to do with it? It happened fast. Oh, the intimacy of passing him in my bathroom unmasked while he removes his contacts. The giggling, the hiking isolated in the city under bare branch lacework framing a robin's egg sky. The bringing of the wine, the bubbles in the glass, the two-stepping, the double timing. He's always leaving town, even when he is right next to me. What's this all about? I wake up with him in my head, descending. Is he a sorcerer? I mean, the physical stuff, or just a colossal tease. He creates famine in my heart. I'm starving all the time. He tunes it up to where I will feel it the most, then disappears into smoke and mirrors, corkscrews into my obsessive, keeping me wet without ever slaking my thirst. So here's my dilemma. Fuck him right now, right away, and hope it gets him out of my body and go on, or never speak with him again and go on. This can't end well. All right, thank you. Uh, next up, we have Lou Grouper. Hi, um, I have not written a poem about Corona, but right after okay. the inauguration, I wrote this. 2021, Joe and Jill and Jabari and Julia, the powers that be, we joyfully joust. Andy in Albany, tax the rich, don't be afraid to call them a son of a. The squad is growing. It will soon be a platoon. AOC and Jamal are shooting for the moon. The working class is rising. How fast and far will we grow? Our struggles will lead us to the future we go. And this one, I think I read earlier, another time here. Uh, the political revolution, a birthday wish to Bernie Sanders. It uses the concept of kintsugi, which is the Japanese concept where they want to show when something is healed, they want to show the stitches, not hide them. I see the stitches in the cracks where the pieces are mended, the holistic kintsugi of a new way of seeing. When the corruption all around us is washed away in a sea of rebirth, almost as if evolution builds to a revolutionary rupture in the old Trumpian corporate capitalist culture where the neo-fascist twist is overthrown. And finally, if I still have time, I'd like to read uh, one by somebody else always. This was written by Ross Gay. On, it's on, you can find it on poets.org. A small needful fact is that Eric Garner worked for some time for the Parks and Rec Horticultural Department, which means perhaps that with his very large hands, perhaps in all likelihood, he put gently into the earth some plants, which most likely, some of them, in all likelihood, continue to grow, continue to do what pl such plants do, like house and feed small and necessary creatures, like being pleasant to touch and smell, like like converting sunlight into food, like making it easier for us to breathe. Thank you, Lou. Thanks for being here today. And um, next up after James Dean Rivera, um, I'm, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, but it's either Leela Bertillon or Leah Bertillon. You're on call next after James Dean and then Samantha Park. So um, let's go with James Dean Rivera is up next. Go ahead. All right. Hello. 
Hello, everybody. How are you guys today? Thank you so much for having me. And um, my name is James Devereaux, of course. And I'd like to read two poems to y'all. The first poem I'd like to read to y'all is called Dear Surviving World. I wrote this in the beginning of the pandemic last year. And here we go. We will overcome this crisis. We will survive this. With a strong immune system and faith, we will not let this seal our fate. We will be allowed to travel and walk in parks again. The restrictions will be lifted by then. There will be no more, no more lockdown or quarantine. The regular way of life will be redeemed. You can once again walk amongst the crowds. Going to bars and restaurants will be allowed. Most people will still die for this is over. For most, it will bring people closer and closer. For most, it will take time to recover. But for many, a new life will be discovered. Dear surviving world, we got this. And that's the first piece for tonight. The next poem I'd like to read to y'all is a poem that I actually wrote when I was like, I'm guessing 16 years old. And I found this in my class recently. It's called Those Who Are. And here, happy are those who enjoy life. Sad are those who are heartbroken. Angry are those who hate others, afraid are those who fear others. Greedy are those who think of themselves, thoughtful are those who think of others. Ignorant are those who refuse to learn. Educated are those who want to learn. Unhappy are those who refuse to laugh. The life are those who think, like to laugh. Losers are those who never try. Winners are those who give their all. Cherish are those who love others. Hateful are those who doesn't want to love. Dead are those who doesn't want to live. And I am a person who wants to live. And um, those are my two pieces for tonight. Thank you so much for being here. I hope to see you again next time. All right. Hope to we see you, have... Slender. All right. Next up, we have, um, can, and if you can tell me how to pronounce your name the right way, Lila or? Lila. Lila. Layla. Okay. Uh, and your last name? How do you say your last name? Bertalan. Bertalan. Okay. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, and hi. Uh, earlier on, I enjoyed the whole Bucharest Budapest confusion because I'm in Hungary here. Ah, uh, welcome. Welcome. <laughs> All right. So let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to open today's board meeting by pointing out the fact that Temple Grandin was right. Cattle are calmer and more easily led to slaughter if they are given clear directions, bright reminders on the flooring beneath their feet, and no idea where they are really going. Even better if they have no idea that they are cattle. That, that way, any resistance can easily be eliminated and maximum profits extracted from farm operations. Some species might be more tractable than others, and there's a particularly hardy, stubborn breed any form farmer needs to handle with caution. In fact, I would not recommend this one for be beginners at all, as they are resistant to overt direct instruction. It's better to use more oblique methods with them. It has no particularly distinct coloration, as it comes in a variety of shades and patterns. The ones with a mottled, earthy colored covering seem to be the most dangerous among them, particularly the ones bearing stars. However, most individuals in this breed tend to have a liking for bacon as a supplement in their feed. This is a relatively new breed, developed in the 18th century, although some say it's already endangered due to its unpopularity brought on by its unpredictable nature. Free range husbandry is highly recommended. Remember, the less the animals realize that they are on a farm, the better. The, a particularly useful distraction for this purpose is the use of goats. Scapegoats are introduced into the coral and pointed to as the culprit for any and all inconvenience experienced by the rest of the animals. If you put two of them into the same environment, paint one red and one blue, chances are that the cattle will divide into two main groups, constructing their own reality around their favorite, and follow it wherever it may lead. As long as this doesn't interfere with them following the arrows on the floor pointing towards the entrance of the meat processing plant, this behavior is harmless and even provides an outlet for potentially more destructive impulses. 
in case your animals are starting to realize their actual situation, you can stir up conflict among them based on color, horn shape, and other superficial characteristics. Some experts of animal husbandry have succeeded in inducing so much fear in their cattle that most of them were reluctant to leave their stalls to go to pasture and needed to be fed indoors. This sped up their growth and the production of fatty meats, so it had a beneficial effect overall. Currently, we are networking with top-notch veterinarians to find out what other unorthodox practices may be introduced in order to make farming as efficient and as profitable as possible. We, we agree that they know best when it comes to safety measures and animal welfare after all. Thank you very much for being here. Welcome. Um, and next up we have Samantha Park and then Peter Kozlowski and then Peter Schrager. Hi there, thank you for allowing me to join. I'm Sam Park. Today Welcome. I have two poems for you. The first is a haiku about COVID and the second is one of my own, um, not relating to the prompt. Um, the first haiku that I have is racism versus COVID, a haiku. I wear a mask to protect from a virus, but not from their hatred. The second poem that I'll be reading is Catching Water. Capturing you is like catching water. There are parts of you that fit into the contours and crevices of my hands perfectly, as if I was always meant to hold you. I collect your pools of thought, curling my fingers around them to keep them safe sacred, protected, and every once in a while I am met with a mirror of my own countenance. I drink you. You hydrate me. I feel you trickling down my throat, cooling my heated opinions and softening my tongue. I wade into you. You cleanse me. When you rain on me your precipitating ideals, I cradle my palms and collect as much of you as I can, folding my fingers tightly to keep any droplets of you that I can catch. Like sweet spring rain, you leave kisses on my fingertips, puddles on my fingerprints, and you melt into my pores, appearing as if we were always the same shape. But you are fluid, and that is hard hard to grasp. It's not that my hands aren't strong enough to hold you. It's the peaks and valleys in them that were created to irrigate the parts of you that I wasn't meant to hold. These spare droplets that trace down to my elbows leave cold breezes of evaporated expectation. And when I take a sip of the remaining reflection, my thirst becomes greater than what I am capable of holding. And then I realize that what could nourish me could also drown me. Thank you. Samantha. All right, next up we have Peter Kozlowski and then Peter Schrager. Got to unmute, Peter. Okay. How's that? Very good. Welcome, Peter, everybody. All right. So I'm trying to use a mixer here and try to monitor the mix. So uh, try to make it right and turn down your radio, as they say. Yeah, so they can't go to the mall, but they go to social media and they have different payment systems. But one way or another, we Americans are buying so much stuff made in, in Asia, right? That the shipping lanes are clogged. They can't find enough containers to bring it all over here for us. Knives and diamonds, knives and diamonds, they'll cut you to the heart. 
They've already sold you before you get old. You will ask them who you are. Knives and diamonds stuck in you. Knives and diamonds from head to shoe. Knives and diamonds, knives and diamonds, they twinkle just like stars. A princess eyes them, young bucks buy them, they know not what they are. Knives and diamonds around your neck. Knives and diamonds, the head. Knives and diamonds, knives and diamonds, you wear them in your hand. You let them feed you, you think they need you, you think you have a plan. Knives and diamonds around your waist. Knives and diamonds, <coughs> the lay you waste. Knives and diamonds, knives and diamonds, they're on your TV screen. Against the window, the midnight wind blows, a lonely echo screams. Knives and diamonds, they're in your dream. Knives and diamonds, making you cream. Knives and diamonds, knives and diamonds, they're not the only game. You let them play you, and doubtless lay you, your friends all do the same. Knives and diamonds, the heartless friends. Knives and diamonds, the hound you. Peter, the sound sounded excellent this time. It really made a difference, I think. Great. Very good. Very good. All righty. And going on with the show, we have Peter Schrager with us all the way from the other side of the world. Thank you for being here, Peter. Thank you. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay. Poets with masks, half performing in front of a masked audience. No mimicry at all, hiding behind the life-saving tissue, the redeeming tissue, the providential tissue. Poet's breath shortened, laugh cannot be seen, sorrow cannot grace the visage. Nobody really sees the poets. Ancient Greek drama with masks. Are you grieving? Are you laughing? Feel the soul rejoice in spirit. Forget the funeral face. Shun the visage. Burka time has arrived for women and men. Your bloody fear, the unseen coronavirus, it takes lives. Just take care, just beware. Don't shake hands, it is killing you. If you embrace, you die. Don't kiss, forget love. And thus, health will save you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. And then next up we have Karen Scott and then Parker and... Um, then Lloyd, um, I have you on the list as um, 
Lloyd Abrams, but I see you have a different screen name up. So, oh, we have Lloyd Abrams is up, up next. So we're going to begin with uh, Karen Scott. Are you, there you are. I wasn't planning on reading, Linda. I oh, okay. Well, welcome for being here. Thanks for being a great audience member. Thank you. All right, we're going to go to Parker. Are you planning to do anything today? Um, yeah, uh, I plan to do like a short little rap for you guys. All right, excellent. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. Um, the song is called I Love Y'all. It's going on an album that's coming out later on this year. And uh, I just wrote it about COVID because me and my family caught COVID in the beginning this year. So just happy that they uh, we all made it out all right. So here we go. Mama, my daddy, my friend, my dog. I love y'all, my mama, my daddy, my fam, my dog. I love y'all, my mama, my daddy, my fam, my dog. I love y'all, my mama, my daddy, my fam, my dog. That's so obvious, no wonder why y'all honor them. Same name, but different beings. Something like a homonym. Fortunate to have them all. Friends who I acknowledge them. Feed up on my ottoman. Hard pill that I'm swallowing. Nothing here is really mine. This body I'm borrowing. Too concerned with socials and my status. Who I'm following. Even though they pluck my nerves with all of the hollering. Wouldn't trade for nothing else. Yeah, I'm keeping all of them. Used to think if I could trade places, life wouldn't be bad. Especially the past relations that I had with my dad. Same time, I'm confident that he's having my back. I love y'all, man, and know that's the fact. Well, I love y'all, my mama, my daddy, my fam, my dog. And I love y'all, my mama, my daddy, my fam, my dog. I love y'all, my mama, my daddy, my fam, my dog. I love y'all, my mama, my daddy, my fam, my dog. A lot of people used to say that blood is thicker than water, but I got some friends that's closer than PB and J. Otta. My brother had prevented me from taking a life, and my sisters helped me see what I want in a wife. My mama taught me how to love and love unconditional. Even though I take the trash, I still won't clean the dishes, though. Dad taught me to chase a dream with all that you got, so I put my all into it. Don't believe me, just watch. I went from where I was to where I am. The fallen angel had the plan, boy. Came over, oh, yes, and trilogy in high demand. Packaged up in tape, young spider ready to fly. I love y'all, it's a fact. I promise this is no lie. Wow, my mama, my daddy, my fam, my dog. And I love y'all, my mama, my daddy, my fam, my dog. I love y'all, my mama, my daddy, my fam, my dog. I love y'all, my mama, my daddy, my fam, my dog. And that's it. Thank you so much. Great. That was great. I hope you come back next time, too. All right. Um, welcome. Well, we, we have a lot of new people today, so that's very exciting for me. Um, and we'd love to see our old timers, too. But uh, all right. So moving right along. Uh, Lloyd Abrams and then Vivian uh, Goldman Leffer. So um, Lloyd Abrams is up next. Oh, hi, this was written back in April of last year, and I, who would have thunk, you know? COVID non-standard time. For over 40 years, I wore a wristwatch every day, particularly when I was teaching because the classrooms in our high school had no clocks. And so to commemorate my retirement 18 years ago, I stopped putting on a watch, though I still have my cell phone. Along with climate change and disastrous political decisions, but especially with the coronavirus pandemic, comes the horror that the world as we've known it is self-destructing and our lives will never be the same. So I felt anxious and out of sorts, ungrounded and fatutst, as they say, even though our home is so comfortable and when the weather is warm enough, we enjoy breakfast and high coffee outside. So I shouldn't complain. We're doing it admirably well. I do know that, or, that orientation is a function of the mind involving awareness of the three dimensions, person and place and time. And with the sun setting later each day, 
every day stretching forward is broken up by writing and reading, by working on the Times Crossroad puzzle, by walking almost every afternoon and sometimes bicycling, while keeping social and physical distance, by sporadic conversations with neighbors, by occasional calls and video chats with our children and grandsons, instead of hugs and squeezes and kisses, by meals prepared at home, by Zoom sessions with their own, with their own peculiar pseudo intimacy, by going through hundreds of emails, by borrowing down into the internet rabbit hole, by searching and shopping on Amazon, by playing solitaire and Sudoku, by listening overnight to sports and talk radio stations, blurring all COVID all of the time, by watching televisions, hundreds of channels, broadcasting their own warped version of the universe. And while all this is going on, it's so difficult to not feel lost, to not be at a loss, to not feel the precariousness, to not be suffused with energy sapping anxiety. Last night, oh man, last night, uh, I lost the line, lost the line, lost the line. Oh, wow. Wait a second, wait a second, oh no. He's so good at computers, you know, but he screwed up this time. Okay. Be there, I'll be there, I'll be there. Okay, last night in a moment of serendipity, I strapped on a really worn, comfortable and unobtrusive Seiko analog quartz watch that was bought around 1990 and it stayed hidden in a nightstand drawer and amazingly is still keeping perfect time. Now to check what time it is, instead of switching on my cell phone and seeing a photo of us on the lock screen with this ever present notifications for this multi-pixel demand for attention, all I have to do is turn my wrist to feel a semblance of control and a sense of normalcy. Thank you for the extra seconds and thank you for having me here. Thank you for being here, Lloyd. All right. Um, I noticed Mark Blickley just left and he was coming up on the list. I wish I knew I would have moved him up and gave him a chance to read. Um, but uh, next up we have Vivian and then we will have um, Paul M and then David L. Sasser. And that'll be the next few for a while. So uh, Vivian is up next. Uh, what happened to her? Did she disappear? Uh, I saw her here a moment ago. Madeline or Philip, do you see Vivian or did she disappear? It was just here. I don't see her. I don't see. If she comes back, we'll give her a chance to get on. Next up, then we're going to have Paul M. Oh, hey, thanks for the chance to play a song. I know there are not too many musicians playing, but oh, I'm going to. Uh, I took a songwriting camp this summer, and this one is a start. Of course, I lost it, so I had to rewrite it today. But it it gets to an issue for me, which is travel. Um, since since the COVID lockdown, there hasn't been much uh, much ways to go anywhere. But so anyway. There's a suitcase in the hall. It ain't going anywhere right now. It's been all around the world, but the lead wheels are locked somehow. Well, I like to pack that bag, but it's filled with memories of the places that I've been and the people that I've seen. It's been rocked to sleep in ships and trains and ice down in poles of planes. But that suitcase is getting restless. Man, it's inching toward the door. I may not go with him, but he won't hang around here much more. Suitcase in a hall, it ain't going anywhere right now. 
Well, it's been all around the world, but the wheels are locked somehow. Well, I like to pack that bag, but it's filled with memories of the places that it's been and the people that I see. So the real song goes on for about five more minutes with a bunch of instrumental breaks, but I'll, I'll save you guys the pain of that. So th thanks for the chance to share it with you. Thank you. It was very fun. And I hope that suitcase gets some action soon. All right. Next up, we have uh, David Elsassa, then Mark Johnson, then Jason Epps. So uh, David Elsassa, you're up. COVID winter. I've just lived a winter 12 months long. And on it chills, spring promising only feeble recovery, sands friendly hugs without even handshakes. Sun warms only so much, socially distanced from the fire of shared vitality, without human embrace. Why I'm bone chilled missing the smiles of passersby and passing by good friends unseen. There's a reason bandits wore masks robbing. And I'll presume to speak for everyone, since I know this is the misery we all face. Hey, I won't just speak, I'll shout. I'll bellow big tent, a universal whelp and wail. Let me be Whitman's cosmic eye, roaring for all the restaurant meals, museum visits, theater performances, blind dates, camping trips, and baseball games we've each missed. Each and every human gathering and activity we've all pined for, for way, way too long. We've got a biblically proportioned great gripe going here. Why, Noah only had to float his boat for 40 days and nights of drippy ho-hum. He and Mrs. Noah rolled around the hay they swiped from kangaroos and llamas for 40 days and nights. But then, 40 days later, the sun returned and all hooves danced on deck. So I petitioned the heavens, please sail us on a short arc to recovery now. Please let the horrendous curve nature threw us these many months curve quickly towards rapid recovery from now on. Thank you. Thank you, David. Good to see you today. All right. Um, next up is Mark Johnson and then C.O. Moed okay. and Jason Apps. So Mark Johnson, go ahead. Okay, am I unmuted? Yes, you are. We hear you loud and clear. Okay. Uh, these were written a long time ago, way before COVID, but they seem to apply today or lately. First one's called Musings. Mind's eye, eyes mind. Grown weary, bored with looking out at same old changes. Turns in toward the labyrinth. Except if you can't find your way out, what makes you think you can find your way in? Fall. How far back can we go? Smoke and jackets. Former lives and cold rain. Time to leave again. Time. Don't worry. You have all you need. And the second one, another short one. It's called Brief Candle. When we are young and warming up, we think and feel and grow and never die, even in imagination, unless perhaps the world dies with us and we cry big tears looking in from outer space. Getting older, we start to worry about our hearts, our lungs, our heads, and the time remaining. But the thought is fixed before we are born that if we are fast enough, careful enough, clever enough, death will pass us by. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mark. 
All right, next up, um, we have CEO Moed, and then we'll have Jason Applebaum. Hi, thanks, Linda. Hi, guys. Being here, Claire. Suddenly, 21 times. Rising rates, hot spot, piles of bodies, and I suddenly feel like I'm in that story I read as a girl, the end of the world, the woman writing her last words about how they all loved until the final minute. Okay, then, I'll keep writing no matter what. Ted's autistic son calls frantic. His stepfather just told him there are food shortages in New York. We just got back from Trader Joe's, Ted tells him. We're fine. Our people survived the pogroms and the camps, I tell Ted. We will survive. The news from Spain. Patients over 65 taken off ventilators, sedated so they die peacefully. I say to Ted, that's genocide. He says, that's a decision. I said, no, it's genocide. All that money for guns, that's a decision. Early morning, empty street. Little girl and daddy singing as they walk down 12th Street. I lean out the window, join in. Another trip to Trader Joe's, shopping for neighbors more fragile than we are. Run into the two young guys from next door fleeing to their country home. NYU just evacuated Robin from 12th Street to 23rd Street. The 82-year-old neighbor next door is defiant. She is not going to stop going out. Utter silence. Like a 1970s Sunday morning. I want to just sit here and listen. I have loads of writing today, but something says, enjoy, enjoy this quiet. The noise will return soon. That piece of shit is condemning all of us to death. Between bullying and being bully stands a warrior. I need to be a warrior. Late afternoon, watching an elderly man be bumbled into an ambulance, like watching people being rounded up one by one. Prayed for him as they drove off. What if it isn't asthma? Dropped off cakes for the few neighbors remaining in the building. A baby died, a five month old baby, right, right every ounce of rage and pain, right revenge write every molecule of revenge. If he wins again, can we flee the US? We make a 72 hour list. What can we take? What do we leave behind? But what about the cats? You got muted. Sorry, 4.30 a.m., uh, no sleep again. Look out onto the street. A young man storming up and down 2nd Avenue with drumsticks practicing in the air. Harry drives by, opens the sunroof, little four-year-old hands pop out. We all wave to one another. Cricket stops by with jelly beans. Ted gets upset when we hug each other. 2.30 a.m., dead quiet again. I used to go out in the middle of nights like this, sit at the counter for Selka, write crap, sip tea. Frantic news from old friends. Victoria died. Go write. Go write everything. Thanks. Theo Moed, thanks for being here today. And now we go to Jason. Thank you, Linda. Epps. Jason, it's your turn. Hi, everybody. Jason Applebaum. Welcome. The title of this poem is Dandelions Make Good Citizens. Where are all the gobbler wobblers? Sleeping perhaps with their tummies rising and falling like a moon that keeps rising and setting on the same side of the sky. They should be having a good time at coffee shops and pizza stores, taking in spoons with pinkies up, proof that they were not so poor that they had to eat their pinkies. Or the wobbler bashers, smiling with broken missing teeth, looking for a fortunate situation to smash and bash. Oh, and the sloshmongers drinking till the stars drip white crossing the sky, and they, possessed by their spirit, speak in ancient slosh, creating poetry, songs. Why they can't be like dandelions, held in groups, green leaves drinking light and round flowers like 
gobbler meant buildings and holding only the most impressive residents. Yes, dandelions make good citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. And next up, we have Lloyd Garrison and Sharon Dockweiler and Vincent Quattrochi and Dennis Doyle. So Lloyd Garrison is up next. All right, can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Welcome. Great. Thanks for being here. Um, uh, thank you so much. I'm going to read a poem uh, it's related to COVID. It's called Mental Jail. So we all have our own way of dealing with COVID. And um, this is the poem that I wanted to read to you guys. I'm not sure how I ended up here in this mental jail, but I feel like we've been trapped here in this place for years. Even though the calendar says it's only been about a year since some strange virus called COVID-19 came from China. And no, I really can't explain how it feels to be stuck indoors most of the time. When people were, we were put on this earth to spread our wings, see their families, see their friends and see the world. It's crazy because one day I'm feeling fine and the next day I feel like I'm losing my damn mind. And to be completely honest with you, I never knew how real depression was and so I looked in the mirror and thought about how many people are suffering from it. I never imagined I would be scrolling through old pics and family trips on my phone to remind me of what life used to look like when things were actually normal. New normal, you know what that means to me? It's just a dressed up way for the CDC to say, we can kiss the life we once knew and love goodbye. And I even, I can't even tell you the difference between pandemic and epidemic. All I know is the same shit I read about in seventh grade history class is coming back to haunt us in 2021. And I know I'm supposed to be the strong one in my family. But there are just times when I need to be weak and allow the waterfall of emotions on the inside to finally show up on the outside. Some people are just professionals and smiling through all the rain and all the pain. But I've reached my breaking point. I'm doing everything humanly possible to stay positive, even though all I see around me is sickness. I see death. I see violence. And you know what else I see? And you probably see too. I see color-coded infection maps. And even though my mind is stable most of the time, my heart rate goes up and down based on what I see on TV. How many phone calls I receive from family or friends back home or how many citizens app notifications I get. Is everybody okay? That's, I guess all we have is questions until all of this virus shit is all over. But my head remains focused on us all getting out of this mental jail together one day. I don't even know about you. All I do is I know about me. But I wake up grateful to be on the right side of living and the wrong side of death each day. I wish someone would have told me that my high school and college classmates, they will be in the same mental jail as me. But I guess they are too preoccupied with showing off their relationship status on Facebook to admit it but I can't knock them for that. We all have our own way and our own fashion for getting out of this mental jail together. This mental therapy is what I call it. It's true. I'm in a mental jail right now. And if I'm real and you're real with yourself, you probably are too. But one day I will free and you will be free. We will all be free. Just wait, you'll see. Great, Lloyd. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank now you, everybody. I appreciate Char it. Sharon Dockweiler. Come back next month. We'll be here next time. Definitely. Hi, Sharon. Hi, I have two. The first one, can you hear me? Yes, yep. we can hear you. The first one is this one. I'm so glad I quit smoking before COVID. Never mind the complications it would cause. I can just see me stepping out of every building, trying to light up as the cigarette hits my mask. I had a hard enough time smoking when I was helping out a friend by clowning at a workshop she held. Ever try to light up while wearing a big red rubber nose? 
The next one is called Sick Together. Mom threatened to hit me over the head with the bottle of water if I prompted her to take one more sip. You want to go to the hospital, Mom? No, she bellowed. You're getting dehydrated. I'm getting dehydrated. I'm drinking much more than you. We both have to keep drinking liquids. I'll wet the bed, she complained. I'll change it, I promised. Leave me alone. I'm trying to keep you out of the hospital. I'm not going to the hospital. I'm going to the hospital if you keep stressing me out. We're both running fevers. I'm exhausted. Please, I don't want to be sick alone. Just take a sip. Come here, she said. She pulled me in for a kiss and squirted me with her water bottle. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. Next up, we have Vincent Quattrochi. Vincent, are you here? I'm not sure if my internet is going not too well or... Vincent? Vincent is here. He's muted. You froze for a second. All right, we're back. All right, enough of, like Phil says, don't explain. But it is still for Verla Storm, who didn't knock me out. <laughs> he should have. Mr. Tween, better watch out there, Mr. Tween, Mr. Tween, because they're coming for you. There's no doubt about it. You're an old, bald white guy in t shirts with the new du jour bullseye on your back and the terrible now, the way of thinking, you're a skinhead, a white supremacist. You'll be disappeared just like Aunt Jemima, Uncle Ben, Dr. Seuss, and all the Redskins and the Blackhawks and the Indians who got put out of the tribe. The new tribe is spoken. Now, you're going to, uh, did you think you were any better, Mr. Tween? So you're going to get yours, Mr. Tween. It's time to clean up, Mr. Tween. All your ingredients send suspect messages, much like the replicant in Blade Runner. You've done questionable things. Forty years ago, you flirted. You made certain remarks. And you were assured. They'd be whitewashed. No way there, Mr. Tween. Think there is a new cleanser in town. And terrible now. And no, it will not be realized or resolved. Nah, think dissolved. Mr. Tween, Mr. Tween, Mr. Tween. Oh, by the way, is Mrs. Tween out there? Better call home and see if anybody's still there. Name Mr. Clean. Baby. <laughs> I just thought I'd change Vincent, it. Vincent, right. I think. Mr. Phil and I All talk right. about it. It's a work Thank in progress. I, I, I knew you're done, right? Going. I don't want to cut you off. Oh, I'm fucking done. <laughs> yeah, I've been done. Thank you, Linda. Right now. <laughs> All right, my internet went a little in and out, so I apologize if for um, for that. Um, next up, we have Dennis Doyle and Deborah Clapp. Um, Dennis Doyle, you're up. Hey, thank you so much, Linda. I really appreciate this. Hope you feel better. Good to see you, Dennis. Good to see you, Dennis. It's a song I wrote during COVID. It's called Sweet Love. Maybe it would, it was possible I tried to do this last time you had it, but I, it's too crowded to get in. Well, get in there, welcome. Sweet love 
need to say But I say it anyway The song's about your sweet love Stop and think about you All the time And you know I cannot say But I say it Anyway It's really all about your love beautiful thank you for being here um all right next up we have deborah clapp and then we have joe rorty uh bernita boswick uh, bernard hicks steve slavin and um we're running coming to the end of our list but those are the next few coming up so uh deborah clapp you're up next thanks linda <clears throat> thanks linda uh so there have been a lot of uh gifts received during the pandemic and this is not one of them it's called Pandemic Scam. On a hot sunny day amidst the global pandemic, cheating scammers make a fierce attack upon a vulnerable woman who in a gullible moment lost her mind and the spine in her back. Her fear of aloneness makes clear she's alone. In a second, she's put into a trance, into a fear-based vacuums hypnotic zone their words start to spin, whirl, and dance. They're telling her she's hacked. Get the money. A Target gift card will do, and we'll block the hackers. Don't worry, honey. We've got you. They were right, honey. They had me. A victim with a capital V. More dumbass, stupid instructions ensue. They're thinking, We'll make this bad situation worse for you because we lie and you must bear and grin it. Your money will be ours now in less than a minute. She hands them her money in a slippery submission, calls her friend, then the bank, then the Federal Trade Commission. She's no longer alone. She's back home and speaks. You scheming, scandalous, sick serpent, freaking ridiculous freaks. I forgive you, motherfuckers. 
To you, my money, I yield. You're depraved in your weakness and your unconscionable, fake, flaccid shield. I admit my unconscious, unconscious, disappointing mistake. I embrace and return to myself here, awake, staying safe, bathing wounds, letting go for love's sake. Thank you. <laughs> Deborah Clapp for being here. Thank you very much. Next up, um, I just, we're gonna let everybody who wants to read uh, a chance to read, and I know it's almost nine o'clock, but we're probably gonna end closer to a little bit in like 9.30, so. Uh, thanks for staying with us. And next up, we have Joe Rorty. Welcome, Joe. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, this is for Ted. The death of stars is the death of ourselves. On a grander scale, maybe, maybe not. The devastation following can seem the same, at least to me, fixated as I am on a single existence and the existence of others equally single, who seem to burn a steady glow, a relative glory moving through time, glowing and flaring, sometimes fading or with no warning, a final burst, then disappearance. The sky a glare somewhere in the final loops of time, Gravity's askew, and all for the loss of you. Something against the dark that lit the way at night, a center of myself that brought me to a light. Thanks. Thank you, Joe, for being here. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Renita Bostic, and then um, Bernard Hicks, and then Steve Slavin. Renita, Hi. you're up. How are you? I'm going to perform a little comedy that happens to fall into the same theme tonight. So give it up for me. Tonight is officially my 215th time on Zoom. Okay. In the All past right. year, I am Yay. so over it. I am so over it. I'm over it, Linda. I'm so <laughs> I over know. it. It's ready to get back in person. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. And you know what's funny? It's funny because I would say that I've heard somebody somebody smoke alarm for at least 200 of those times. You know, like, don't you hate that when you're on Zoom? It's so freaking annoying. And you're like giving the person the death stare through your screen. Like, I know you can hear that because the rest of us can hear it too. It's awful. Like sometimes it's so loud. I convince myself that I smell smoke and it's my place on fire. Like that's how loud sometimes it is. I'm trying to be professional, but you don't know how many times I just want to unmute myself and be like, please get that shit fixed. Okay. We ran out of toilet paper, but not batteries. Like there's no excuse, you know? And I have to say this. I know there's a lot of Caucasian people on here, but I have to be honest. I have renamed this year white people gone wild because you guys have been doing some crazy things in the past year. Like seeing all these white people across the country who don't want to wear their mask and they can't go into certain places because of it. The other day, I saw this lady yelling at the top of her lungs, you can't make me wear my mask. I do whatever the hell I want to do. And I have hard to prove I belong here. Now, it was at that moment that I know that she had watched the movie 300 way too many times during quarantine, because all of a sudden she turned into Gerard Butler. And she, had, she pulled out this miniature flag from her purse. And she said, this is America. And I'm looking at her like, no, bitch. This is Costco, okay? And you need to calm the fuck down, okay? Calm down, okay? I'm just trying to get out of this place. I get out of this store safely. And stop yelling because your COVID droplets are all over my Coke. And now I have to sit the shit outside of my house for the next 24 hours before I can drink it. And I live in the hood. So it's not going to be there when I wake up in the morning. Okay? I'm an educator. I'm a high school counselor. Virtual school has been interesting to say the least. Believe it or not, a lot of parents have no idea what's going on with their kids. No clue. I called a parent the other day and I said, ma'am, we've been in school 100 days, but your son has only been here for two of them. She said, well, how was I supposed to know he wasn't going to school? And I'm like, how can you not? You're home with him. <laughs> like he's sitting right in front of you. And didn't you say that you keep seeing him walk out of his bedroom and sit in the kitchen for a few minutes and then go outside for a while? She said, yeah. I said, so what do you think he was doing? She said, going to lunch in PE? I thought he was following his schedule. I'm like, not quite, ma'am. That's my time. Thank you guys so much. 
Thank you for being here, Bernita. Hope to see you back in next time too. All right. Um, next up, um, we have um, Bernard Hicks, and then um, I have Victoria Hill, and Steve Slavin, Jane Spokenware, and then Noah Levin. I think that's everybody. So um, Bernard, you're up. Hello, everyone. And I can't believe I had to follow Bernita because now I got to take this silly grin off my face because that was funny as all get out. That was hilarious. But thank you everyone for having me. All the best to everyone who's going through the trauma of what we're going through. I wrote this poem about a year ago, a little after the pandemic first started. And I wrote it because I started to realize how I was spending my time differently pre-pandemic than I was post-pandemic. So then I realized I have time to do things that I haven't had time to do beforehand. The title of this poem, I've had time to. I've had time to watch Madam C.J. Walker work magic to black women's hair, living in the true hustler spirit and become America's first woman self-made millionaire. I've had time to watch Sugar Ray Leonard look like a young Muhammad Ali, watching Mike Tyson hit like George Foreman, making fighters pray on their knees. I've had time to listen to Minnie Ripperton take me back down memory lane singing notes that last forever, like a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I've had time to watch Michael Jordan float effortlessly in the air, as if stepping on the notes of a Miles Davis tune, staying suspended in the air like the smoke in a cigar-filled room. I've had time to watch Carl Lewis take off like the roadrunner in a Saturday morning cartoon, running at the speed of light. Could have sworn I seen him standing on the moon. I've had time to listen to Stephanie Mills sing her song Home, always feeling like she sang it to me first. I think God was listening to her sing while he was creating the heavens and earth. I've had time to watch Paul Robeson sing. I've had time to watch Jackie Robinson swing. I've had time to watch Dorothy Dandridge move and watch Lena Horne do her thing. I've had time to listen to Millie Mel lyrically paint the picture of every ghetto USA. I've had time to get ready to I had time to get ready to listen to politicians speak, knowing I wouldn't believe a word they had to say. I've had time to listen to my own thoughts as they're speaking to me in an Ozzy Davis voice, letting me know there is always a fork in the road, reminding me to pause and to make the best choice. I've had time to listen to Martin Luther King speak, resonating like thunder shaking the concrete bringing joy, pride, and strength to my soul, all the while realizing he would never live to be old. Memories of my sister and brother up in heaven playing spades with one another, knowing he's making sure she's okay, just like a big brother. Whenever you get a second, ask yourself this question. Have you ever been changed when history and time teaches us a lesson? Remember, Something as beautiful as a rose has thorns. Something as powerful as money has wrongs. When slavery was going on, they sang songs. Something as troubling as life we wish long. Watching time on my side, watching time pass me by. Watching the methodical movements of the hands of time. Watching time tell me, is my time to shine. Time. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you, Bernard. Thanks for being here. All righty. Next up, we have uh, Victoria Hill and then Steve Slavin. This is called uh, Damp Pity. A damp pity was where I sat when I could only fold socks, smoke, drink, watch a clock, and stare in a basement all day. I wallowed in my damp pity like a willful bludgeoned masochist and thought it's holes, black circles, and sure in whiskey for breakfast and wet animal smells were where I'd live for good if I could, because I needed it. When the dog pulled me on catatonic walks around the block, dragging the shell of a woman, a wife, a mother, a once human person behind him like a solemn soldier on a mission to save his fallen lieutenant. And I needed my damp pity when I stood at the stove forgetting how to scramble an egg because it gave me an excuse not to try and to just eat cereal. It allowed me a room to sink into all that is and to not just be, but to it be inside a pity that was ultimately, I thought, 
meant for me. A vast black sea buoyed my horizon with more losses, anger, karma, and a twisting kelp heartbreak around my legs that nearly drowned me. I learned to swim through them, then reach a shore. Here I'd resurrect myself with wood beams and steel, mud shells, stones, and bones, all it'd take to make me warm and tell and tall, wide and real, so I can live with a fervor and purpose because that damn pity doesn't serve me anymore. And this, this other one's called Archimedes 519. We ducked in to wring the storm from our clothes and waited, crumpled and sodded, sodden, inside a hotel named Archimedes. Maybe that's me, I looked in a mirror, camel coat, white sneakers with red stripes. Smile wild, umbrella inside out. We left the football sized peonies and beecher bow. Still had pedals in our pockets and a glass in our gaze from the drive. The man on the street, he passed to me shelter like a baton. The transaction smooth through the watery sheets. I hadn't said a word. He pushed the handle into my opening fingers and took the money gone. Inside, I heard someone in the lobby say, and he showed us we can move heavy objects with small ones. I listen to them prattle about the Greek inventor who came to Sicily, and I hold the heavy brass talisman hooked to a key the bellhop handed me, a solid brass replica of an old ink stamper. It feels safe and balanced in my palm, like the luggage strapped to my back and held over my arms. And as we ride up in the elevator, I think about how maybe Archimedes might say, my feelings, my hopelessness, my grief and despair, they too have gravity with weights that'll always burden me some, but this means then maybe some days the weight of those burdens will fall down perhaps and drop away. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you for being here. And um, we have, I, we're down to the end. So um, we have Steve Slavin, Jane Spoken Word and No 11. And if there's anybody who didn't read that I missed, please write me a note in the chat right now and I'll make sure I get you on, but I think that's everybody. So. Steve Slavin, welcome. Here you're on. Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes, very I'm well. Unmuted? Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, well, one of the things I've noticed listening to everybody else is almost all of us have lived um, through the 60s twice. And what I'd like to read is some Dear Abby columns from the 60s that will sort of cheer us up uh, in, this, in this time of the great plague. Um, Dear Abby, a woman never pays on a date, right? That's the way I was brought up. So let me ask you, on a date, should a woman ever agree to go Dutch? Dear Dutch treater, only if she has no intention of sleeping with her date. These are the 60s, honey. Better to be known as a sleep around than a gold digger. No one respects a gold digger. Dear Abby, is a girl who goes to a guy's house for dinner obligated to sleep with him? Dear dinner guest, are you going there for the cooking? Seriously, sweetie, if you aren't, you'll certainly make a bad impression. Dear Abby, over the last few weeks, I've had three women over for dinner, but none of them slept with me. What should I do to get better results? Dear cook, you must be quite a cook. My advice, don't feed them until they've paid for their meal. Dear Abby, I've gone out with this guy a couple of times, but I'm not that attracted to him. When should I sleep with him? Dear, not that attracted. You have been leading him on. Etiquette dictates that a woman should sleep with a man by the second date. If not, you'll get a bad reputation. Finally, Dear Abby, I'm sleeping with four different women. Is there anything wrong with that? Dear Romeo, wrong with what? And that is it. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Thanks for being here today. And we have Jane Spoken Word is up next. Hi, everybody. 
My piece is called Winter Has Come to America. I turned on, tuned in, and dropped out in the 60s. You can call me a freak, but don't call me hippie. Spent the summer of love dropping acid, protested a war that lasted and lasted. Released from the confines of society, sisters and brothers stood collectively for equality and dignity. You know we know. We demanded an end to war. Hell no, we won't go. We demanded civil rights and equality. We marched for all of humanity. The music of my time spoke truth to power. Grooving the slide, the family took us higher. R-E-S-P-E-C-T demanded Ms. Aretha, queen of soul. Eve of destruction sang dark truths untold. Dylan warned we're just a pawn in their game by any means necessary, Malcolm X did proclaim. I'm black and I'm proud, testified James Brown. As Jimmy lamented, why'd you burn your brother's house down? And as Marvin sang, mercy, mercy me, when will it end? John Lennon pleaded, give peace a chance. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, rhyme the greatest of all time, my hero, Muhammad Ali. We were a social movement, youth on the rise in a war for equality and respect for all lives. The women's movement defined our objectives. Feminist ideologies demanded equality of sexes. The Latino movement of united farm workers improved farmers' pay and working conditions. The Chicano movement organized students. Edu education, not eradication, brought basic school improvements. The Black arts movement used art as a weapon. The Black power movement championed pride and freedom. Angela Davis, Eartha Cat, Woman Kit, Michelle Uhura, Nicole, Tommy Smith, John Carlo, Nina Simone, and still and still and still, idiocracy reigns. If you are other in America, do you do time every day? If you are other in America, it is a squeeze play. Living your life on an everyday beat, always on guard, avoiding white heat. Winter has come to America. We have been trumped. Whitey is blindly stumbling through life, feasting on Fox, feeding his white. He's scared. He's scared you'll take his guns, his God, his whiteness. So he hides his fright in distorted righteousness. Marching with tiki's is a frightening aberration. Rivers of blood stain our dawn with damnation. What happens to one happens to us all. Like dominoes, we all will fall. Silence is death. So that's my winter has come to America and it's really my COVID poem to remember that while we're all immersed in COVID, there's some nasty shit happening. So everybody be on point and peace and love to y'all. Jane, and last but not least, I give you no 11. Thank you all. And, um, you know, before I, before I read anything, I just want to say, you know, when you, when you have COVID or you're getting over COVID, uh, the teeth of its fatigue really uh, strangles you, and you know you can you can sit in front of the camera and look okay for for a little bit and all, but afterwards you're gonna probably fall unconscious for a few days. So, thank you so much to Linda for doing this today. So, if everybody, you know, seriously from the heart, like it's amazing she's doing this today, and she's sitting there and, and looking great. Uh, thank and you I know for being here, everyone. So everybody, please give her a huge hand, you know, seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. That's very nice of you all. This is a highlight of my last 15 days, believe it or not. So this is, <laughs> this is a joy compared to what I've been going through.
And I am feeling better, I have to say. Oh. I'm getting better. But I, it, the fatigue is terrible. That's the thing that knocks me out. But go ahead, Noah, it's all you for taking away the No, time. that's, uh, uh, so I had COVID really early on. Uh, and in fact, in my, the hospital I was in, in Queens over in Flushing, I was actually, I think I was their first patient uh, to test positive for. So I was really early on. And to what Linda just said, you know, as I was lying there, there was a certain point where I didn't know if I was going to survive. And I was thinking to myself, I had agreed to do a poetry reading uh, a feature before all that. And I'm like, oh man, I can't die. I got to read poetry. Um, <laughs> so it's a true story. It really was like my highlight. So I'm going to read out of a cycle. So uh, I had this a long time ago and I kind of have uh, an accidental cycle of poems of dealing with my experiences through COVID. Just every once in a while, just one kind of pops out of me. Uh, so I'm going to read these. I read them at different readings, but never together. So this is really, uh, I'm kind of excited to do that. And thank you for letting me do that today. Uh, so this first one, this is the first piece I wrote, um, and it was, for, I put this out uh, just as I was starting to recover from COVID, I could first form words, and the first thing I had in my brain was the title, which also shares the title from today's readings. This is called COVID Files, Patient 421. A little sniffle is how it started. Life out on the horizon, and it all seemed so normal. Every day rolling in plans on my calendar, China is so far away. The pandemic of the Great War had hungry eyes that wasn't in my dreams. The earliest of fall, I like to think I'm a survivor and I swear I wash my hands. Yesterday's history is today. No one wanted to hear me as I tried to explain. I swear I got this. Don't turn me away. I can argue with the best of them. They tried to trick me to leave, but I got my way. Entombed. White walls and beeping machines take my blood, so many tests, nameless doctors and nurses, and it's a blur as I was unconscious most of the time and reassuring everyone outside, I swear I'm still alive. It's okay, maybe I got the flu. 17 tests, 20 tests, 30 tests, I'm asleep. The news plays and I haven't seen a window for days. I've tested positive now and Cuomo's on TV. New York is ahead of Washington by one. 421. New York has taken the national lead. I text my mother excitedly. I always said I'd amount to something. Another mass face takes my blood, temperature creeping up, heart rate up. I'm unsure if the person next to me survived. Released by ambulance into isolation, but I can breathe. Another day? Maybe. I look online and my friends are bored. Another baker's bread, puzzle piece, complaints about nothing to do. Booze toasted to you and I. Closed away at home, my girlfriend disinfects everything. Can't eat, can't stand, can't stay awake. Fever dreams, my breathing is leaving me. I continue to tell everyone I'll be okay. Another trip to the hospital means a ventilator shoved down my throat. And I say no, even though I can't breathe. I don't think I'll survive that. Also, I don't like their beds. Days pass into incohesive blur. The girl I love is overworked to the bone. She doesn't complain. Good night. I just don't know. Time passes. One week, two weeks, and I can breathe. Awareness comes back. Strength slowly comes back. I'm having dreams where I lay of a future where I'm out eating steak and ravioli with my girl. I tell everyone I'm going to be okay. The streets are closed now. The restaurants are gone and back again. I see protesters demanding haircuts and freedom unmasked with children in tow. Normality crushed over ledge. United we divide. Lives thrown into the unknown as tragedy hangs in balance. I've lived the future. And now people I know are losing people. And I know people that died too. I check my recovery and my hands are shaking now. Post COVID running through my veins. I have dreams of energy that seeps out of me every time I stand. And I'm thankful to many people, to so many people who cared and so many who helped. Every day is progress and I can be me. My calendar is open for next year. There's everyone I'd like to see. My phone buzzes. A friend learned to play a discarded tuba with pet pigeon on head. I breathe a sigh of relief. Life is becoming normal again. My next piece, so, you know, when I finished that, I thought, I thought life was getting normal, but as we all know, within a week of my reading that, uh, the streets exploded. 
So this is the next piece I wrote uh, back in early June as my consciousness was coming back. These, these next two pieces are short. This is called Recovery at the End of Times. Post-COVID drains my being. Can't stand, can't think, energy gone. I'm in a fog too often to admit, but life force is an irrepressible apparition I saw in my dreams. My awareness is coming back slowly while history is happening all around me and the world is taking a stand. Click on news. 20 million jobless, elderly lost, safety trampled, racial injustice, knee on the jugular. I can hear change calling over there, out there. Police batons, riders, masses, protesters, rights trampled, take a knee, cry and voice, generation scream, past and current societal construct bears weight on soul. Cry a tear no more. Stand up, fire in the sky gas cloud on clothes of those that march. Quarantined eruption. Society must change. Shh. It's quiet on my block now. It's after curfew. I'm sitting in my seat, resting, recovering. I can breathe again. Yesterday, I went outside for the first time in months. Legs gave out eventually. Little victories. And history's happening while I'm watching. Living flotsam who wishes he could stand. No, quiet now. Stay still as night's breeze reinvigorates withered mind, being, body, self. Inhale, exhale, I'm alive. And then my last piece, this is, this is uh, uh, real new because COVID just doesn't let go. And that's the truth of it. I want people to understand and stand strong. You know, we're all sitting in our apartments and staring out and just human the human brain isn't built for that. Um, but I want people to understand why it's important. Uh, so this is the last piece I wrote. Um, I started like, a few weeks uh, ago and just finished it. This is called After the War. Sure. Another day merging into yet another day as grayed out boundaries of time continues to flow, breaking free of the calendar, threatening to derail and untether from all sense of hours and days ticking by. Swept in tide, zombified, lost in a hazed out dream while every day merges into the last day, brain floating through time with hazed out borders on edge. Two and a half million people dead, 100 million infected, 12 months now since I had a sniffle and then a cold and then I couldn't breathe, choking COVID from my lungs out of my being. Days move on, no need to dwell. Grab my bootlaces and pull self out of all engulfing quicksand reality. Wrecked mind. I can see my shattered self in the mirror leaving shards of who I was hip deep. I'm me, but not him from last year. Patchwork person, duct tape pieces of me back together. Let's get serious. One year of healing means my memory feels like a dementia patient. My limbs are heavy with fatigue. Small effort pushes me through a wall. Anything, doing the dishes can leave me exhausted and collapsed. Even doing this now will leave me exhausted, done for today. I'm confused more often than I'm not and need help with simple tasks. A little bit can leave me in a zombie state wandering my home not knowing what I'm doing. Now I live in a world of tests, tests, and more tests. The doctors don't know why. I'm a stat that says recovered, but I'm not really. I don't know if I ever will. I was healthy. I wasn't old. This can be anyone. It's not another flu. It's not another flu. It's not another flu. It's not the flu. It's not the flu, you bastards. Ah, well, shit. Sympathy is just a penny in the change cup and I don't want it. Others are home and bored and I'm happy to be alive. Content. I'm still here even as I raise a fist to daily challenges. But understand this, if you love anyone, wear your damn mask and get your fucking vaccine. And don't become me, recovered into a shattered state. I'd sit in isolation forever to keep those I know alive. And me, now, I'm here. I stand fatigued, but I stand blessed. And today I plug my battered, broken brain into the internet and share thoughts globally while next year is still coming and we'll raise a glass to us and our health and those we lost. And now we'll sit in place staring out the window watching infinity roll into the horizon. Possibilities. Stay safe. Stay safe and smile. Thank you all.
Thank you, Noah. And thank you, everybody, for being here. The next show is on April 4th, and that is Easter Sunday. Um, can you give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down if you think I should have a show? I'm not sure if people would show up if people do things for the holiday. So, I don't um, do anything for the holidays for brownstone poets. Yay. That, those are the major okay. pathways. I'm people not think we should, will people show up if I do a show? Yeah, I'll show up. All right, guys. So I think I'll have a show. Um, we can unmute everybody right now. And everybody Linda, thank you. Everybody. Linda, everybody. thank you. Linda, thank you so much. Yeah. Feel better. Feel better. And feel better, Linda. Thank you. 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 Linda. Very cathartic. Uh, Thank you. I'm going to... All right, guys. Thanks, bye, Linda. Madeline. Bye, everybody. Uh, Thanks, Linda. Good night, guys. Bye. 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 Thanks. Good night. Feel better, Linda. Bye. 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 I'm Great way to end the show. All right. Good to see everybody again. <laughs> <laughs> is he still there? There he is. I just felt I had a message for you. Linda, you too. What's up, Vincent? Real quick. Murph's on the phone and he wished that he could have fucking been here at the end, but it got time got short. Oh, you could have forwarded him the link. You should have I you could have I did, I did, I did. I mean how many oh, comments? Oh. Well maybe we'll get him to come to the next show. No, it wasn't your fault. He's not on Facebook, so he couldn't. I told him it had to go the other way. I think and, he got an email, so um he 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 No, he didn't take care of it. See All right, well happened. Tell him to come to the next one. We'll yeah, be around absolutely. on April 4th is the next show. He said he was in the Bahamas. And Phil? Oh, yeah. I, that's, that's what I heard. He went to the Bahamas. Yeah. He Mr. lived a tough life. Mr. Clean. Yeah. Thank you for Mr. Clean. Mr. Clean. All right. Thank All you. All right, guys. Thanks for staying. I know we ran late. Thank you. Oh. Judith. Thank Philip you, Judith. wrote to you on the private chat. We miss you. I'll send, I'll send the chat out to people so they could look at it. I don't get to see all the things in the chat during the show. And so Dennis, we'll I love you, out. man. Good to see you again, Dennis. Okay. All right, guys. I'm going to turn Thanks. the meeting off. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.